Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Otter Talk number 25. We're glad that you, you are here. Tonight's uh, Otter Talk is on hemangiosarcoma, and Dr. Jaime Morimo has uh, been gracious enough to uh, give us this presentation. Um, I'm going to be in the background. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, direct them directly to me in the chat. And then if there's time um, at the end, we'll go over those. Um, and with that being said, Eileen, I'm going to turn it to you to go ahead and uh, do the introductions for us. Thank you. I'm very happy to be able to introduce Dr. Jaime Modiano to us. Um, he is, uh, has been doing a lot of research on cancer, and I first heard him at the Canine Health Foundation Parent Club Conference, and I heard him there several times. Uh, he holds the Alvin and June Perlman Endowed Chair of Animal Oncology and is the Director of the Animal Cancer Care and Research Program of the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota. As you can see, he has a VMD and a PhD from um, the Veterinary Medical Scientist Pro Training Program at the University of Pennsylvania, followed by a residency in clinical pathology at uh, Colorado State University and a postdoc fellowship at the National Jewish Center for Immunology and Respiratory Medicine. Before joining the faculty at the University of Minnesota, he served on the faculty of Texas A&M University and the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. Dr. Modiano also works in the private sector as founder of Half Moon Bay Biotechnology, Apoplogic Pharmaceuticals, Veterinary Research Associates, and most recently, Canine Biotechnology. He is a director of cancer immunology and immunotherapy for the Donald Monk Cancer Research Foundation. As you can see from his resume, Dr. Modiano seeks to understand how and why cancer happens and to develop strategies for improving the health and well-being not only of our companion animals, but also of us human beings. His research has been supported for 27 years by both federal and private um, sources. He has co-authored hundreds of scientific papers, abstracts, presentations, book chapters on immunology, cancer biology and genetics, and diagnostic and therapeutic innovations for cancer and immune mediated diseases. Um, Dr. Modiano is married to Dr. Michelle Ritt, a, a diplomate of American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, and they are uh, the proud owners or owned by two German Shepherd dogs. So uh, both of which are promised to be very good, probably better than our otter hounds during this presentation. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Modiano. Thank you, Eileen. And thanks everybody for joining us. I really appreciate the uh, the invitation. And, and yes, our girls should be very, very good. They are now um, over with mom, uh, taking, taking care of her, such as the case might be. Um, it's great to be here. And I, I love talking about the work that, that we do. And um, I was trying to remember if I've had a chance to speak to the Otterhound group before. Um, I think the answer is no. So um, thank you for welcoming, welcoming me to your group and uh, into your homes. So, Without further ado, um, I will get started. And, and um, before we start, I have to get through some uh, business. The, uh, the legal team at the University of Minnesota reminds us that we have to disclose all of our potential um, conflicts of interest. And so I will let you know that um, I do still hold an equity interest in apologic pharmaceuticals. Uh, I'm a founder or a co-founder of Canine Biotechnology, which is a company that seeks to bring some of the um, technology that you'll hear about today to the commercial space. Uh, I'm a founder and manager of uh, Veterinary Research Associates, and I receive licensing fees from uh, various companies and have a variety of patents in diagnostics and therapeutics. And the University of Minnesota is very proactive on uh, reviewing and managing these um, potential conflicts of interests yearly uh, in accordance to its policies. So. Okay, <clears throat> and certainly um, 
I would like to make this relatively informal. So please um, feel free to ask me any questions in, in during the talk if there's something really pressing. Uh, I think Robin will be looking at the monitoring the chat or the Q&A. So you can also type your questions and she will let me know if it's something that we need to uh, address quickly. Um, what I'd like to do is divide the talk today into several um, quite brief sections. I am not going to go into a lot of deep, hard data. I will show you a little bit of data for, for each section. Uh, if you want to see more data, it is in the background. I can pull it up. Um, but the, the different sections uh, that we're going to discuss, um, the first one is called Travelers and Architects. And I want to tell you a little bit about the cells that actually give rise to hemangiosarcoma, which is something that um, has taken us about 20 years to really begin to understand, um, starting from the point about 22 years ago, where we realized that a lot of assumptions um, that people were making were not correct. Um, then we're going to talk about gene mutations and hemangiosarcoma. And the title of that section is, is it many or not too many? Um, then we'll talk about perception, reality, and everything in between. And, and what we really know uh, and not what we think we know about dog breeds and risk of hemangiosarcoma. Um, then we'll talk about why won't they die. So this is the vexing problem of why hemangiosarcomas are so resistant to therapy. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the new drug that we've de developed at the U of M called EBAT, um, maybe a tiny glimmer of hope and a new opportunity. And finally, I will tell you about the Shine On project, which is um, really the the cornerstone of our refocus on strategic um, early detection, risk assessment, and prevention. And, and what we believe is, is a milestone um, towards our vision, which is to create a world where we no longer fear cancer. So um, six, six sections, and um, hopefully we will have time to do that and still have time for a uh, nice Q&A session. Um, what are the things that I'd like for you to remember? So most of the time we do these talks and five minutes later, you know, dinner, agility training, et cetera, and people forget everything that was said. So maybe we can um, um, go through some of the things that hopefully you'll be able to remember when you wake up tomorrow. Well, one is that, that canine hemangiosarcoma originates from cells that um, support the formation of blood cells and blood vessels. So unlike the prevailing notion that these are cells that that these are tumors of cells that line the blood vessels. That's their, their sort of um, uh, gross and microscopic appearance, but the origin seems to be quite different. And, and that's important because it tells us a little bit about the biology of the disease. Um, the second take home message is that you will hear a lot about mutations uh, in hemangiosarcoma. And basically what I wanna tell you is that th there are many, many different mutations that are associated with this disease. Most of these are associated with aging. Um, they, they happen through really random processes of life. Uh, and ultimately they select for cells that, that are very good at surviving everything we throw at them. So um, I, I guess the take home message would be that um, it is going to be really hard to pinpoint the mutation that is associated with hemangiosarcoma, um, tackle it with a single targeted drug um, or even prevent it because again, um, uh, we, we get old and, and our systems get frail. And um, part of what happens then is that um, our bodies create a, an environment that is more permissive or where it allows cancers to, to grow and develop. So uh, we have to solve aging at the same time as we solve hemangiosarcoma. Um, I want you to, to I, I really wanna drive home the point that there are no differences in the in the properties of hemangiosarcoma among dog breeds. There might be some truth of, um, to the fact that some breeds might get the disease a little bit more frequently than other breeds do, but really this is a peculiar disease of, of dogs, and it is not something that has been really bred into a particular breed or group or something that could easily be bred out of the um, uh, any breed or the species as a whole. Um, the resistance to therapy that we see is, is really a, a major problem in terms of trying to cure the disease. And, and that resistance is something that is, is really part of the process of how these tumors develop. Um, and so in part, because treatment is so difficult, 
we have decided that the best way to treat cancer is to make sure that it never happens. And so by looking at uh, early detection, risk assessment, and targeted prevention, we might be able to reduce the impact of hemangiosarcoma across the canine world. And maybe we can actually bring what we learn in dogs and bring it um, to the world of humans where cancer is also a problem. So we're gonna start with section one, which is travelers and archetypes. So the cells that give rise to hemangiosarcoma. And I call them travelers because they come from point A to point B. Um, point A usually being the bone marrow or another blood forming organ. Port, point B is wherever the tumor is going to start. Um, and we call them architects because they actually build a home. So hemangiosarcomas are not just random collections of malignant cells, they are very, very well organized, even though to our eyes they may seem chaotic. They, they really have a, a defined organization that requires a lot of components that go beyond the malignant cells. Okay, so um, this is what we call the blood forming niche, um, the, the place in the body where blood cells, um, blood vessel cells and other cells um, begin, are formed and go to their rightful place. Um, and, and the example here is the bone marrow, although there are several blood forming organs in the body, the bone marrow is the largest and most important one. And so what you see in this cartoon is um, this is the outside of the bone. This is where the hard bony part is. And in here is the inside of the hollow bone. And this is what we call the bone marrow. And within the inside of the hollow bone, we have um, areas where blood flows and exchanges oxygen and nutrients with all the cells that make up the, the bone marrow. We have at the centerpiece, a what we call a hematopoietic stem cell. This is the, the cell that gives rise to all of the cells that populate our bloodstream, red cells, white cells, platelets. And then you've got these other supporting cells. So osteoblasts form um, bone, uh, osteomax or um, um, cells that actually nibble away at the bone to, to help it remodel. Um, you've got um, nerve cells that come in. And then you've got these um, supporting cells that are called stromal cells. And we've got uh, a variety of them. And it turns out from our research that um, these um, stromal cells, the uh, CXCL12 um, uh, uh, enriched cells, as well as the uh, leptin receptor positive cells, as well as these nestin positive um, mesenchymal stromal cells, seem to be the guys that really are responsible for giving rise to hemangiosarcoma. So we, we don't totally know whether these cells become malignant in the bone marrow, or whether um, they travel somewhere else and they become malignant there, or whether they in fact reside in the spleen, heart, liver, skin, and that's where they become malignant. But one of the really interesting things about these cells is if you've known anybody who received radiation therapy, or even if you know someone who was a victim of a radiation accident, um, if you give them support, their, their blood system essentially collapses. Radiation is very, very good at killing blood cells and blood cell precursors. But if you give them time and support, the whole blood forming organ can regenerate. And the reason that that organ regenerates is because these cells are incredibly resistant to um, things that damage DNA and kill cells. And so it's really not surprising when we start thinking about the fact that these seem to be the cells that give rise to hemangiosarcoma, that we treat these tumors with really, really strong chemotherapy that, that damages DNA and kills cells. We treat the tumor in some instances with radiation therapy and eventually the tumor tends to come back. And one of the reasons is precisely because the cells that we need to kill are very, very hard to kill. And so we need to come up with different strategies and we really need to understand how these cells go malignant. And instead of forming a nice organized blood forming organ, they form a tumor. Okay, so the cellular origin of hemangiosarcoma, the cells that really give rise to, to the tissue that we call a tumor, are these specialized cells called nurse cells that I just pointed out that inhabit all blood forming organs, the bone marrow, spleen, liver, uh, and, and other organs that actually help to give rise to blood cells. These nurse cells support, support the growth and the development of blood cells. They also support the growth and developing of the cells that form the vessels through which blood cells travel, and they probably give rise to other cells as well. So they are, in a sense, Stem cells, stem cells meaning that they can give rise to a variety of different cell types. 
And, and the biology of these nerve cells, as I mentioned, in terms of their, their drug and radiation resistance, as an example, um, drives not only the biology of the disease, but also its very complex organization. Okay. So, um, and, and, and we have, of course, uh, lots of experiments and lots of data that have led us to these conclusions. So again, I'm trying to give you sort of the meat um, without giving you a lot of the, the nitty gritty details, but I'm happy to talk about the details if anybody's interested. So, so you've probably heard about mutations and cancer, and there's an incredible focus on mutations. You've probably heard about a lot of companies that are sprouting up that, that are um, testing for mutations, recommending um, targeted therapies, looking for mutations that may be present in the circulating blood. And so there's, there's really a lot of emphasis on mutations and cancer. And of course, having grown up as a disciple of Peter Knoll, who is the father of cancer, modern cancer genetics, uh, I've spent a lot of my career thinking about uh, genes, mutations, and, and cancer. And um, they are, of course, important, but they're not the whole story. So what do we know about mutations in hemangiosarcoma? So we know that the most common mutations in this tumor are mutations in a gene that is called TP53, and that encodes a tumor suppressor protein um, that's called P53. And, and when we say tumor suppressor, it, it, we mean that the job of this protein is actually to screen the genome for mutations that are dangerous. And if those mutations are dangerous to actually um, orchestrate their repair or to lead <clears throat> the cell that carries that malignant mutation um, to kill itself. And so this is what we call the guardian of the genome. And um, it is so important that it is actually inactivated probably in 70 or 70% or, 70 or greater of tumors across pretty much all vertebrate species. So when you look at a tumor, it doesn't matter if it started in a minke whale or if it started in an opossum or if it started in a dog or a human, uh, about eight out of 10, seven or eight out of 10 of these, these tumors that we see are going to have inactivated this particular gene and its protein product through some mechanism. So it is one of the strongest cancer protective mechanisms that we have acquired through evolution. Um, canine hemangiosarcomas also have recurrent mutations in genes that, that control a pathway that we call phosphonositide 3 kinase or PI3K. Um, and, and this pathway is regulated by a number of proteins that come into it. Um, the most common gene that is um, mutated, and, and in this case, it is actually turned on, is called PIK3CA. And this is the, the catalytic subunit or the business end of this um, protein that we call PI3 kinase. And so um, this, this particular mutation is really interesting because we think it is um, singularly responsible for the appearance of the tumor to look like it is what we call basoformative or blood vessel forming. Um, this, this pathway is one that is um, strongly activated during normal formation of blood vessels. And so it's inappropriate activation seems to be part and parcel of the organization of the tumors. And, and there's a, a number of other mutations in other genes that we have observed and reported, but um, the recurrence, meaning finding them from one patient to the other, to the other, to the other is low. So they might be present in just a handful percent of, of all of the hemangiosarcoma tumors. Um, and then one of the other things that's really interesting is I mentioned this PI3 kinase pathway as being central to blood vessel formation. It turns out that you don't need to actually introduce a mutation in a direct member of the pathway to get that pathway to be activated. There's a lot of ways in which the pathway is activated. And it turns out that when we look at hemangiosarcomas, we look at these tumors that look like um, tumors of blood vessels, this biochemical pathway is activated across all tumors, regardless of what mutations they carry. So of course, this leads to the question, why are we not targeting this pathway um, to cure hemangiosarcoma? And, and the answer is, um, we are, um, many people are, um, but this is not the singular driving event. It is only one of many events. And so inhibiting or altering this pathway does not seem to be enough to actually lead to a cure. Um, I, I will give you a little bit of optimistic uh, perspective that says that, that perhaps soon, one of these compounds that attack the PI3 kinase pathway may become part of the standard of care 
and might give us a bit of a jump in improving outcomes. But I can tell you that we already know it is not going to be the absolute cure. So little by little. So um, we've come up with a model for the, um, the pathogenesis or the, the, the way that tumors develop and behave based on uh, mutations. And so I think we were the, the first to actually develop a molecular model that describes hemangiosarcoma as a conglomerate of multiple diseases rather than a single disease. Um, we have known for a really long time that under the microscope, we can divide hemangiosarcoma into three or five different subtypes, but there, there really was no difference in, in the behavior of the subtypes based on what they look like under the microscope. So um, we have been able to actually look at beyond the microscope, looking at the organization of genes that are turned on, that are turned off, the mutations that are present, and, and can now actually group these tumors um, according to these mutations and, and really start to think about predicting how they're going to behave and thinking about how we might treat them. So the first group um, are tumors that do not have mutations in either P53 or um, the PI3 kinase pathways. And, and these guys um, don't have a lot of signaling that, that forms blood vessels. There seems to be a lot of immune activation. So, so the immune system seems to recognize these. And we call them non-angiogenic, meaning that they are not forming very clear blood vessels. Um, however we treat them, these guys seem to be the least aggressive and the ones that, that basically account for all or most of the cases of hemangiosarcoma that we see that live a really long time. So one thing that I will point out is that you might have a friend or a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend or someone who you saw a post in Facebook that said, my dog was diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma and my vet gave me some magic powders and I gave them to my dog and my dog lived two and a half years. Well, chances are that their dog um, had one of these relatively indolent, not terribly malignant hemangiosarcomas and that it was going to live that long regardless of whether there was magic powders or aggressive chemotherapy or anything else. Um, the, the next um, so set in the biology is tumors that have a mutation in this PEK3CA um, gene or a related gene, as I told you. And, and these activate other um, biological pathways. And we start seeing uh, a trend that will become apparent here. And this is the first of a group that we call angiogenic hemangiosarcomas. These are tumors that when we look at them under the microscope um, are actively forming um, blood vessels, and when we look at them molecularly, they have all of the elements turned on to make um, blood vessels, okay? And so um, as, we, as we move forward, now we have tumors that have a mutation in P53, um, and the mutation in P53 may be accompanied by other genetic changes, and the pathway that, that or the pathways that are principally activated are now different. And, and I won't bother you with the names because it would require several semesters of biochemistry just to see that there are different parts of the cellular machinery that are activated. Um, and we start seeing that, that the signaling of this PI3 kinase pathway is somewhat diminished and we start seeing other things happening. Um, and then we have um, events where we have um, mutations that inactivate P53 and activate this PI3 kinase pathway that I told you about. And there may be other events. And what we see here is again that um, um, changes happen. And so you can see that the, the original pathway that was activated is now inhibited. Um, the signaling of this PI3 kinase biochemical pathway that I told you is somewhat reduced. Um, the nuclear organization that, that determines what genes can be turned on or off is now changing dramatically. At the end, we have profound immunosuppression so that the immune system is, is completely inactivated in terms of recognizing the tumor. And of course, as we, as we go from left to right, these become the most aggressive, um, the most deadly, and the hardest to treat tumors. Um, and as I said before, these are not really associated with an organ, a breed, an age. There's a lot of these things that unfortunately happen um, just because of the, the processes that happen when we have um, cells that are living. Okay, so to summarize, mutations in hemangiosarcoma are conserved sometimes, but not all of the time. Um, and, and when you actually see multiple tumors in the same individual, you can actually see that each tumor has its own mutational profile. And that's, that's interesting and something that I'll get into in just a little bit. 
Um, the mutations that we see in canine hemangiosarcoma that I just told you about are not specific for the disease. The same, the same genes and the same types of mutations occur across a wide variety of tumors. So these really are mutations that disable the cellular safeguards that protect against cancer, and they're not mutations that cause hemangiosarcoma. Um, most of the mutant genes that we've noticed favor um, increased cell division. But, so they, they tell cells to continue dividing, uh, lose the control that would make them stop. Um, they also favor survival. So um, most cells that are abnormal will actually commit suicide or otherwise be killed. Um, these genes actually help them overcome the drive towards committing suicide or being killed by other mechanisms. And they're lineage independent, meaning again, that they're not unique to um, vascular cells or um, the cells that give rise to hemangiosarcoma. They happen um, basically across all of the cells in the body. Um, and there is minimal overlap with the genes that are mutated in human angiosarcomas. And you will see, if, if you read the scientific literature, um, you will see that there are a couple of papers, including ones where I'm an author, where it says, you know, canine hemangiosarcoma is similar to human angiosarcoma, and there's then a qualifier. And it turns out that that is true, but it's only true for a very, very small proportion of tumors. So, so, so the, 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 the overlap in the two universes is, is rather minor. We can definitely learn about human angiosarcoma by studying canine, and we can read about canine by studying human, but they are not the same disease. And finally, as I said before a number of times, there's no relationship between the mutations that we see and breed. So, so the susceptibility is not something that we've bred into, and therefore a particular breed is going to develop a particular mutation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so if you remember, if I go back one slide, the first point here was that the mutations are concerned so sometimes, but not always, um, in multiple tumors uh, in the same individual. And so this is illustrated a bit here. And so this is our, our model. Our, this is our best model for hemangiosarcoma progression. We, we know some of this is true, and some of this is still a hypothesis that we're testing. So we believe that hemangiosarcoma originates from cells that start in the bone marrow. And, and the malignant transformation event can happen inside the bone marrow, or it can happen outside the bone marrow. But these cells are able to leave the bone marrow and distribute to multiple different organs, okay? So we have heart, liver, lungs, spleen, skin, and others. And um, depending on where the transformation event might have happened, these cells can seed organs um, after they have acquired malignant potential, or they can acquire malignant potential after they travel to their target sites. Um, once they reach an organ, um, the cells actually have different pathways of evolution. Um, in most cases, the malignant cells probably remain dormant for really long periods of time. So they can um, seed an organ and just sit there doing nothing or building the environment that's going to allow them to grow. Um, the interaction between the malignant cells and the microenvironment eventually can allow one or more tumors to develop. Um, and the tumors can grow and develop at the same time, or they can grow at different rates and develop separately. So in our conventional thought of metastasis, where a primary tumor is related to a metastasis that is related to another metastasis, what we would think about is, is for example, that a tumor would start in the spleen, and that cells from that particular tumor would then travel to the heart, and then cells from that particular tumor that came from the spleen to the heart might travel to the lungs. And that when we actually looked at these tumors, we would actually be able to see a progression of that tumor evolution where we could find that they were all related. Um, what we find in many cases of hemangiosarcoma is that the relationships between um, the tumors in the same animal are um, hard, hard to follow. And so it turns out that, um, that these tumors seem to actually develop independently. And over the course of their history, they might acquire different mutations different biological behaviors. And so while we do see some instances of sort of prototypical metastasis, tumor starts in the spleen, goes to the liver, goes to the heart, they all look the same. In many cases, it looks like these are multiple different tumors. Sometimes what even happens is that we have a dominant tumor that may be growing, for example, in the spleen. Um, um, we believe that it is possible that this tumor is repressing tumor growth in other organs. And when we remove the spleen, then that, sent, that, that um, context of negative regulation or negative feedback is gone and other tumors can grow rather fast and that may be part of therapy failure. 
Um, this, this actually is a phenomenon that was originally reported um, um, in, in humans, and it gave rise to the idea of um, um, angiogenesis and angiogenic uh, suppression, which turned out is, is um, an absurd phenomenon, but it, the, the theory of how it was involved in cancer progression was not quite right. Um, so Judah Folkman, who came up with the theory um, from his days as a surgeon, is truly a hero of oncology, but uh, only part of his um, hypothesis and his theories ended up being correct. A very important part. Now. Okay. Uh, let me stop for a minute and ask if there's any questions, because I, I know that this is sort of a counterintuitive and uh, contra-dogmatic, and so um, I want to make sure that um, I haven't lost anybody before we move on. So far, there's none in the chat, but if anybody does have any questions, feel free to uh, let okay. us know right now. We'll, we'll, we'll keep moving. Okay, so perception, reality, and everything in between. Um, so you might think that this is the face of hemangiosarcoma, right? You go to any Facebook group or Twitter or you know TikTok or whatever, and people talk about golden retrievers, uh, the breed is dying of hemangiosarcoma. Um, you might also think that this is the face of hemangiosarcoma. So German Shepherd dogs were the initial breed that was described as having a predisposition for hemangiosarcoma. Um, but I can tell you that this is also the face of hemangiosarcoma, and, and we have permission to use all these pictures. These are um, patients that have come through our clinic um, for treatment or for clinical trials. And this is the face of hemangiosarcoma, 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 and this is the face of hemangiosarcoma. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is that Dogs can be big, they can be small, they can be purebred, they can be mixed breed, and they can be a variety of ages, although we do recognize that hemangiosarcoma is, is a disease that mostly affects older dogs. Um, when we look um, historically, in the 1960s, there was a breed predilection described in the literature where German Shepherd dogs seem to be more affected than other breeds back in the 1960s. And, and this was actually originally reported out of continental Europe. Um, this, this was then replicated in the early 1970s in the United States. And since the 1970s, there have been many breeds that have been added to this high risk group, okay? Um, but this breed predilection seems to be dynamic. So, you know, breeds come into the, high risk group and breeds fall out of the high risk group. Um, and, and I think that there's um, a, a lot of the component of why breeds move in or out has to do with increased awareness, improved diagnostic methods are less likely due to changes in population structures, um, popular sires, et cetera. And so I'll tell you a story. There's, um, there's another um, club, breed will go unnamed, but they happen to be short little dogs that, that look like a sausage. and um, in the, in the 1990s, um, a lot of those little dogs would collapse at a certain age and the owners would take them to the vet and the vet would say, well, of course it is a you know short squat little dog that looks like a sausage. And so the, the reason that the dog collapsed was probably that um, you know, he had a slip disc. And you know, the prognosis is what the prognosis is. And, and many of those dogs would be put down without any further ado. Um, in the early um, 2000s, in, in the aughts and the, in the early teens, um, there, there seemed to be a, a, a new epidemic of um, the same breed um, collapsing due to hemangiosarcoma. And so, so there was this, this um, you know, sort of freak out moment where people said, oh my God, we've bred something into our dogs that... Um, is, is making them be at risk for hemangiosarcoma. So the only thing that changed is that um, some very astute veterinarians and observant owners decided to actually look at what was the cause for the dogs collapsing rather than just assuming that it was a sl slip disc. So for some dogs, it was a slip disc, but for other dogs, it's that they had hemangiosarcoma of the spleen or another organ and they bled and they collapsed and they looked like hemangiosarcoma dogs. And so as soon as people stopped making an assumption that it just was a disc, and they actually went and looked, they realized that many of these dogs 
probably not more than we would predict for any other breed, but more than the breed fancy might have been used to, um, we're getting hemangiosarcoma. And so it, it really was not that there was more hemangiosarcoma in 2010 than there was in 1995. It's just that now there was awareness, there was improved diagnostics. And, and as one person became aware and started talking to their neighbors or their friends in the breed, other people became aware. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted to find out why their little dog collapsed. And, and so, you know, it didn't have to do with having bred in the disease. It just had to do with actually recognizing the disease was present. So um, I think this is true for, for a lot of breeds. And so when people go golden retriever, of course, it's going to die of hemangiosarcoma. It's because the breed fancy has been aware of this disease for, for a really, really long time. And they've been proactive about trying to understand it and do something about it um, and, and not sort of ignoring it or hiding it under the bushes. Whereas for other breeds, um, it, it's not really something they think about. And so if a 14 year old dog collapses and dies, maybe the family is not really all that keen at that point in having a necropsy done and trying to find out why it happened. So, so that really is part and parcel of this um, sort of understanding or misunderstanding of, of breeds and hemangiosarcoma risk. So the perception of, of risk comes um, mostly from admissions to veterinary teaching hospitals and from breed health surveys. Both of these um, are, are good, but imperfect. Um, the true numerator, so if you think of a ratio, the numerator on top and the denominator on the bottom, for the whole population are not known. We don't really know how many dogs of a breed are, are out there. We, we know how many are registered, but we don't know how many are out there. Um, and so, and we also don't know all the ones that get disease. So, you know, the ones that get disease would be the numerator. We don't know the true number and the total population is the denominator. We don't know the true number. We make some guesses, but those guesses are fraught with bias. Um, and that bias not only includes the, the numbers that we have, but it also includes perception bias based on the prevailing assumptions. So when we say, well, of course, we see more golden retrievers, that feeds into our, our psyche of thinking we know what we know, and it just reinforces that. Um, and so when we actually look at the data objectively, th there actually may be a component of heritable risk. And when we did a study in golden retrievers, we found that there actually may be a region of the genome that uh, is present in golden retrievers. And we are still not certain whether that's golden unique or whether it's sort of something across all dogs that seems to be associated with, not necessarily caused, but associated with um, the development of hemangiosarcoma. And so, you know, whether it just happens to be uh, that it's an orange and we have a plate of fruit or that, you know, it is the orange that's giving rise to the plate of fruit, we don't know. But um, we know that there's a tiny little bit of heritable, what we think is heritable risk in goldens that may or may not be present in other breeds. And these are ongoing studies that are being conducted mostly by my colleagues at the Broad Institute. Um, so when you look at um, a, a breed cladogram, as is shown here, so we have wolves and then we have breeds grouped um, according to uh, their relatedness and, and the um, sort of AKC groups, um, you know, we have the retrievers. And of course the retrievers say, I get hemangiosarcoma. But, you know, we've got the sporting dogs and they get hemangiosarcoma too. And we've got the hounds and they get hemangiosarcoma too. And, and so on, as you can tell. And in fact, even the wolves, if we keep them in captivity long enough and we protect them from all the other things that can kill them before they reach the ripe old age of eight or 10, can get hemangiosarcoma. So, so again, this is not a disease of a single dog. It is a disease of the whole universe of dogs and there might be some subtle differences in between. Okay, so we will leave the breed susceptibility behind. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll give you some food for thought if you're thinking about should I breed my stud or should I breed my bitch and their third cousin, four times removed, died of hemangiosarcoma, am I doing something wrong? And, uh, you know, you, you can breed on what you know and not on what you don't know. Um, and so let's move a little bit into why won't they die? Why is hemangiosarcoma so hard to treat? So clinically, hemangiosarcoma is a drug-resistant tumor. Uh, interestingly, for the tumors that happen at or near the surface of the skin, the skin that need treatment, um, we find that the tumors are more 
sensitive to radiation therapy. So radiation is a great uh, resource for some tumor types, but it's very, very hard to radiate the heart or the lungs or the spleen or the liver. So radiation therapy is not commonly used for the, the tumors that we call visceral, the ones that happen inside the body, but it is a really wonderful tool for tumors that happen externally on the skin or right under the skin. Um, once we see a tumor, the cells have undergone many, many generations of, of selection uh, for survival fitness. So they've had to outcompete all the other things around them um, and really learn how to live in a, in a very, very difficult environment. So um, in addition to the fact that it's hard to get the drugs to where the cells live because the, the circulation is poor. And so we only know how to get drugs into tumors mostly by putting them into the veins and letting the bloodstream carry it there. Um, the, once the drug gets there, these, these cells just look at it and they go, ha, huh, you know, I've, I've survived bigger, badder things than you. So the, the cells have undergone this intense selection. Um, and again, the, the tumors create this very complex home or environment um, that prevents normal circulation and, and the cells thrive on having low oxygen and lots of inflammation. So places where, where none of us would like to live um, these cells actually make their home and they're very happy there. Um, and, and furthermore, the malignant cells that we sort of want to kill uh, can make up as little as 20 or 30% of the whole tumor tissue. So um, we're bathing a lot of non-malignant cells with our chemotherapy, while the malignant cells might actually be protected in, in places where we can't get to. So um, drug resistance is not only intrinsic to the tumor cells that have undergone the selection and are able to resist, but the, it's also an, sort of an anatomical and physical impediment of not being able to get the drug um, to the place where we want it to get. And so I can take hemangiosarcoma cells from a dog, I can put them in a culture dish, and I can show that all of my drugs are, are perfectly capable of killing the cells, or maybe that none of the drugs are capable of killing the cells. But that's a huge difference from saying, I can kill the cells in a dish from I can kill the cells <clears throat> in a patient that has a tumor. So I'll spend a little bit time, a little bit of time telling you about EBAT. Um, so um, the story behind EBAT is really fun. Uh, it, it just underscores that having um, brilliant students and putting them in an environment where they can spread their wings and do fun stuff um, is the best recipe for discovery. So were it not for a really smart, talented, and curious vet student who happened to be in my lab and didn't listen to me and went and did the stuff that she thought was interesting, EBAT would have never happened. So what is EBAT? Um, EBAT stands for epidermal growth factor, that's the E, bispecific is the B, angiotoxin AT is the uh, end of the, the word. And uh, we called it EBAT because um, it is unique. It, it, it describes what the drug is. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, this word doesn't mean anything in any other language, although I was told that it might be a bad word in Russian. Um, I don't speak Russian, if any of you do, and it does really mean something bad, maybe you can tell me, but we think it doesn't mean anything else. So uh, epidermal growth factor is a, as it, its name implies, it's a growth factor that um, mostly stimulates uh, cell division of cells in um, um, the outer and inner surfaces of the body and the skin and the lungs and the GI tract. Um, bispecific means it's got two different targets or two specificities. And angiotoxin means that um, it is a toxin that um, kills blood vessels and blood forming cells. And this drug was designed and developed at the University of Minnesota by my colleague, Dr. Dan Valera. Um, and he didn't really design this drug to, to kill hemangiosarcoma. He designed it to address um, a, a really sort of universal problem in cancer. And it was, how do I kill the cancer cells and the cells that feed it? So the bispecificity comes from targeting um, the receptors for this growth factor, so the epidermal growth factor receptor, and then receptors for another um, um, protein that's called urokinase. And urokinase is involved uh, in the uh, clotting cascade, but there's also a receptor on cells for this urokinase. And, and those receptors are mostly active during development and, and they're not really active once development stops so in, in what we call the adult animal or the postnatal animal, uh, except under conditions of um, wound healing and tissue repair. 
Um, so it turns out that the tumors sort of um, use this system as something that allows them to, to uh, grow unhindered. And uh, um, one of my scientific heroes, Dr. Harold um, Dvorak from Harvard, um, liken tumors to wounds that never heal. And so, you know, in, in, in the process of wound healing, we, we close the wound, we fix it, we repair it, and then everything goes back to normal. In the case of tumors, the same mechanisms are being um, used to actually continue to, to create growth in that environment that the tumors like, but it's a never-ending cycle. So, um, you know, that, that's why it's a wound that never heals. Um, we have used DBAT in three canine clinical trials. Of course, there was a lot of, of pre-canine clinical work that was done to actually get here. And the drug is now licensed to a company that's called Anavi Life Sciences. And it is in the pathway to um, uh, the, an, an investigation on new drug through the FDA. So this is what the um, protein looks like. It's um, got EGF and um, the amino terminal fragment of urokinase linked together. Um, and then it's got this um, lethal bacterial toxin that has been genetically engineered to be even more lethal. So when people say, why can't you send it to me? Um, FedEx doesn't like to um, carry lethal stuff in their planes. And so um, right now, of course, it's very controlled and it's something that uh, once Anavive is able to distribute, they will, they will manage. Um, and so this is just data from one of our clinical trials. This is what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is basically all of the patients starting at time zero, which is the date of diagnosis. And this is a proportion that are, li that are alive over time. And so the, the dogs in the black bar are the dogs that were treated with a standard of care of surgery and chemo. And the dogs in the dash bar are the dogs that were treated with EBAT. And so I'll point out two things to you. When we look at the halfway point, the dogs that got EBAT live um, you know, considerably longer than the dogs that don't get EBAT. And when we look at the tail, the dogs that actually make it out for you know, a, a reasonable amount of time. So we're thinking of a year and a half being something that we would call a success. Um, we have many more dogs in the EBAT group than in the standard of care group. So that's good, but it's not perfect, right? If it was perfect, the dashed line would be up here, the black line would be up here, and we'd say we solved hemangiosarcoma. So we haven't solved hemangiosarcoma, but we have a glimmer of hope that we might be able to help some dogs live longer um, and um, potentially have more of what we call exceptional survivors. Of course, um, it is important to note that by the time we get um, out to about two years, um, many of these dogs have actually succumbed. And um, of course, many of these dogs by this time were 15 years old, so it may not be surprising. But again, it, it is telling us we're doing something. It is not yet a cure. So how does EBAT work? Um, EBAT targets the, the, the cancer cells themselves, but it also targets the cells that make up the tumor's home and it makes that home inhospitable. So think of um, a home inhabited by really bad people. Um, if you burn their home, you know the frame might still be there, but it's not a good place to live because when it rains, they get wet. So that's part of what EBAT does. Um, it, it targets the inflammatory cells that are sort of protecting the tumor from the immune system. Um, by removing them, and it also unmasks the tumor to the immune system. So in addition to what EVAD is doing by itself, it brings in the immune system to help. So another way to think about it is that the tumor um, consists of the tumor cells themselves, the, the bad actors, and it also consists of supporting non-malignant cells that are sort of the henchmen, you know, the, the guys that carry out the bad things that the mafia boss tells them. And so when we do EVAD, EVAD kills the malignant cells themselves, and it also gets rid of the henchmen, and therefore um, we have better success than some other therapies. So I wanna end on in a really positive note. We have a few minutes left, and I'm happy to stay a few more minutes after, since we started a little after six, to tell you a little bit about Shine On and what we're doing in terms of trying to actually um, find the cancer before it happens and kill it before it forms. So the premise for active and strategic uh, cancer prevention is that we have increased our lifespan in humans without time for compensatory evolutionary adaptation. Um, and so we actually evolved to live 35 years. We now live 70 or 80 years in the developed world. And, and we have not had time evolutionarily speaking 
to create mechanisms that protect us from cancer from the time we turn 40 to the time we turn 80. And so that is why when you look at cancer curves, they're essentially flat for the first 35 to 40 years in humans. And then they spike rapidly and they peak at about 65. Okay, um, cancer is a cost of death for more than a quarter of humans and dogs in the developed world. Um, when we look at dogs and the impact of the industrial revolution, we've actually quadrupled the expected lifespan of domestic dogs in the past 50 years or, or 70 years. So dogs evolved to have an average lifespan of about three and a half years. And when you look at um, dogs in feral situations, wolves in the wild, et cetera, yes, there are dogs and wolves that make it to eight or nine, but that's not the norm. Essentially, the average lifespan is about three years with a lot of infant mortality. Um, and, and once dogs exceed that lifespan, again, their cancer protective mechanisms start breaking down. So when we have pet dogs that are living 9, 10, 12, 15 years, um, we're asking for a lot out of that system that really evolved to live only three and a half years. Um, and again, over the time that we've ex extended their lifespan by, you know, giving them protection, uh, nutrition, uh, using veterinary medicine to remove infectious diseases that would kill them, et cetera, there is no time for their genome to evolve uh, and really adapt for that increased lifespan. So, so the um, frailties of aging become very apparent. And again, the achievement is, is due to the things that we have done, right? Both for ourselves and for our dogs. Um, outside of dogs, cats, and humans, there's really no other species where this has really been achieved. And so again, the price of breaking this longevity barrier is, is increased risk of cancer and other aging diseases in dogs and in humans. So when you look at this graphically, this is a, a graph um, from the National Cancer Institute looking at the rate of cancer over um, time, age. And again, you can see that the rate of cancer uh, up until the age of about 45 is rather small. And this is consistent with what we see in other species where we haven't increased their lifespan. Um, but once we cross that barrier, cancer rates rapidly increase, and again, peaking at about the age of 65. Um, and so this is our evolutionarily adaptive lifespan for humans. And when we look at dogs, this is, these are data from a really beautiful paper from UC Davis. These are data from their hospital. But again, you can see that in dogs, the same thing happens. The curve of um, cancer incidence is really flat for the first three years, three to four years, uh, rapidly increasing thereafter and peaking at about the age of nine. Okay, and so, so this is the evolutionarily adapted lifespan where we have cancer protective mechanisms in dogs and in humans that really keep the cancer rates really low. Once we cross this barrier or this threshold, things start breaking down and we're more susceptible to cancer and other aging diseases. Um, this by itself is a whole course in um, biology. And so um, unfortunately, I, we don't have time to really do it justice. Um, but, but given that, given that we don't want to just give up and say, well, you know, we get old, we die of cancer, we have to think about how we can battle that. And so we think that if we can combine early detection, um, risk assessment and prevention, we might be able to, to mitigate the impact of cancer in, in both our dog and human populations. So let me illustrate what I mean. If we have um, a golden retriever as our poster child, and according to Glickman's, um, uh, breed health survey in 2000, about one in five Goldens will get hemangiosarcoma and, and die from it. So if we wait until we actually see the tumor, the expectation with treatment is that, you know, about dogs will survive about three to six months um, and eventually they will die. But if we can prevent the disease, okay, that then they don't get hemangiosarcoma and they survive indefinitely until they die from something else. So, you know, it's a lot better to think of indefinite survival and death from other costs, assuming that the dog is otherwise healthy, than three to six months with surgery, chemo, lots of time, money, effort, and potentially side effects. So what is success? If we have a um, lifetime risk of one in five goldens, and we say that early detection and an intervention to prevent the disease is successful, how do we define success? And this really is a $64,000 question, right? Is it cutting the rate in half, is it cutting it in a fourth or by 10 or by 20 or by a hundred? So the, these are questions that we can't define ourselves, right? These are questions that we have to define with the community as to what the expectations are. Um, and so the strategy for prevention that we've taken is uh, we, we use early detection or better stated risk assessment 
combined with therapies such as EVA that target the initiating cells and create an inhospitable environment as a rational approach. So one of the really cool things about EVAT is that it's incredibly safe, safe enough to give to a healthy dog. And because it kills the cells that actually make the home, if we attack the home builders as they're building the home, the tumor will never have a place to live. And even if we can't kill the tumor, the tumor won't grow and become a clinical entity. So we developed this test to actually look for the cells that we're interested in. And the first thing that we do is we take a blood sample. Remember, I told you at the very beginning, cells go from the bone marrow to other places. And so we're looking not only for the bad cells that go from the bone marrow to other places, but for the cells that actually build the home. We're looking for the construction workers um, that are going out and building the subdivision where the tumor will live, okay? We lyse the blood, uh, we label the cells with antibodies, um, we do flow cytometry, and then we use artificial intelligence to actually be able to understand whether there's um, risk of a tumor forming or present, uh, versus low risk. And so we're, we're looking not only for the transformed or malignant cells that inhabit the home, but also for the supporting cast that are actually building or making up the home. So in our test, um, in what we call Shine On Phase 3, we did a test where we basically took AKC registered Golden's Portuguese water dogs or boxers. Um, the reasons for why we took these dogs might be obvious, but that's because they paid the bills. Um, the dogs had to be in good health, so there had to be no evidence of cancer, chronic disease, other serious conditions. They had to be six years old or older. Why? I, because I told you this is a time when cancer risk is really apparent, right? So they, they're, they're way past that three and a half year mark. Um, and so we enrolled um, slightly over 200 dogs, and these dogs are being followed for their lifetime. Um, so the, the study was a web-based enrollment. People would come in. They would say, I want to enroll my dog on and on and on. And so um, what happened? Well, first a breed distribution, we hit the mark exactly as we intended. There was supposed to be two goldens for every Portuguese water dog and every boxer. Um, we made that happen. And then when we look at what happened to outcomes by breed, these, these data are a little bit old, um, so they've changed a little bit, but the pattern is pretty much the same. So the green bars represent no disease detectable, um, and these are two years out from testing. Okay, so we did a test and then we followed the dogs and where were they two years out? So um, green bars are no disease detectable. Um, these, these blue um, bars, the, the, light, the light blue bars represent a condition that was not cancer, some disease, but not cancer. The dark blue or black are a mass in the spleen that was not hemangiosarcoma, yellow was other cancer and red was hemangiosarcoma. So this was a little bit surprising to me, but perhaps not to other people. First is that when we look at golden or tourist Portuguese water dogs and boxers, um, two years out from a median enrollment age of seven, um, the boxer group is, is slightly less healthy. So there's only about 45% of dogs that have no disease detectable as compared to golden and some Portuguese water dogs. Um, the other thing that we noticed is that the goldens read the textbook and according to Glickman, you know, 20% of them were going to get hemangiosarcoma, 20% of them were going to get another tumor. They behave exactly as predicted. The Portuguese water dogs are not far behind. So again, they're, you know, 10% hemangiosarcoma, 15% other tumors, pretty much what we would expect. But, but the boxers are very, very different. So um, not only do we have a somewhat fewer healthy dogs, we have many, many more dogs that have other tumors and not that many that have hemangiosarcoma. So this was a little bit shocking to us, but nonetheless, this is what we saw. And again, 200 dogs is a pretty good number, but when it turns out it's you know 150 and 50, so the numbers are still somewhat low. These, these will have pretty wide uh, confidence intervals. Um, when we actually look at our predictions, if we call them uh, low, intermediate, and high risk, um, what, what we see is that we capture more golden retrievers and boxers into the high-risk category than Portuguese water dogs, and this is essentially normalized by age. So it looks like um, um, at the same age, there's something that's going on in goldens and boxers that makes their environment more permissive for, for cancer or for hemangiosarcoma than what we see in Portuguese water dogs. Okay. And when we actually look at outcomes, so how good are our predictions versus outcomes? And these are two-year data, and I'm showing you two-year data because these are, of course, the best data we have. Um, if we assign a dog into a category of low risk, um, as you go over time, so this is the, the time that we tested, and this is based on a single test, um, you see that the probability of that dog developing cancer is quite low, and it starts falling apart at about 
um, a year and a half. Whereas the dogs that test high risk initially, we start seeing an erosion with dogs being diagnosed with cancer pretty early on and continuing to go over time. So that by the time we reach um, a two year mark, somewhere in the order of 30% of dogs um, in the high risk group um, have developed a life-threatening malignant tumor uh, and potentially died from it. Whereas, you know, about um, maybe 10% of the dogs in the lower risk group. One of the things that we also understand is that um, when we retest some of the dogs here that actually fall off and get cancer, they actually convert from low risk to high risk. So this erosion is because time is not static, time is passing. And so while they might have had low risk here, um, their risk might have changed here. And so this, this is leading us to think about um, putting this test out into the real world when it's ready as a test that you would repeat every six months to a year, probably a year. So with you know regular well health checks, um, because we think that a, a, a low risk test is good for about one year. A high risk test tells you that you've got increasing risk of developing cancer at, at some point in the future. Now, of course, it's important to say if you have increasing risk of developing cancer sometime in the future, uh, what do you do, right? As an owner, if somebody told me your dog is going to get cancer in two years and there's nothing we can do about it, I would just freak out. My relationship with my dog would change. I would not see my dog the same way. I would start feeding her steak and potatoes every day. She would get really fat. She wouldn't want to move. Her quality of life would be terrible, except when I was feeding her steak and potatoes. So what do we do? Um, we're trying to incorporate EBAT as our intervention, where if the dogs have high risk, how can we prevent them? So this is a story of one dog that had a high risk um, test um, on, on this date. So this is minus 150 from what we're calling day zero. We repeated the test um, and this is about 80 days before time zero and it's still high risk. And we repeated it again, about 45 days and it's still high risk. So at this point, um, we screen the dog. There's no evidence of tumor. It's just in the high risk category. The owners say, yes, we'd like to try EVAP. So we test right before EVAP. The dog is still high risk. We test right after EVAP. The dog is still high risk. Um, but lo and behold, three months later, we test the dog again and the dog's risk has changed. So, so this dog, this is a really cool story because it's a dog that was actually treated with prevention uh, more than four years ago. The dog is now about 11 and doing great. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there's one dog that we gave EVAT to, we didn't kill it, and it's still alive. Um, so we're repeating this experiment um, right now in, in many more dogs. And this, this trend, unfortunately, doesn't repeat every single time. But what we've seen is that so far, the dogs that got EVAT are doing remarkably well. And some of the dogs that follow this pattern that didn't get EVAT have gone on to develop a malignant tumor. Is that success? I don't know. It, it's too early to tell, but, but this is the direction we're going, right? This is where we think there might be a future for us to really understand what's going on. So, um, so the shine on concept is a new strategy for early detection risk assessment targeted prevention. And we think that if we could identify a significant proportion of do uh, of dogs that are at risk for hemangiosarcoma or other cancers, and we could reduce or eliminate the risk in 50% of them. We could actually save, um, you know, 20 to 50,000 or, or more dogs from dying of hemangiosarcoma or other life-threatening cancers each year. So not, an, um, not a small number. So in summary, what I've told you in the last 40, 45 minutes is that canine hemangiosarcoma originates from cells that support formation of blood cells and blood vessels. That mutations we see in canine hemangiosarcoma select for cells that um, acquire very high survival fitness. That there are no clear breed differences in the properties of hemangiosarcoma. That the resistance to, resistance to therapy is intrinsic to the molecular um, properties of the tumor and also to the anatomical and physical properties of the tumor. And that, that we've developed a new strategy for early detection, risk assessment, and targeted pre prevention that I think gives us some optimism and creates promise to reduce the impact of hemangiosarcoma. So what can we say about progress towards our vision in the last 15 years since I've been at the University of Minnesota is that cancer does not always have to be a fearsome enemy. Cancer risk is a consequence of our success overcoming the evolutionary barriers of aging and, and you know, sort of lifespan. 
that strategies adapted to identify the diseases at its earliest origins, mm -hmm. combined with rationally des designed approaches to disrupt its development, can reduce the impact of cancer in our society. And that we must always think holistically. So we have to support practices for graceful aging. It doesn't do us any good to prevent cancer in an animal or a person, people being animals too, that um, is, is going to have a horrible quality of life. So we have to think of aging as a whole on these um, approaches. So thank you uh, from the depth of our hearts to all of you who have supported our work for uh, more than two decades. And I think together it is fair to say that we're making progress in creating a world where we no longer fear cancer. Uh, I just wanna do a shout out to the scientists behind the curtain. So um, this is my team a few years ago, we need an updated um, picture, but, but um, I love them all dearly. They are incredibly hardworking and it is really their um, dedication and their smarts that have gotten to where we are. And, and just a reminder that philanthropy drives our work. We're very successful getting grants, um, getting big pharma to give us contracts, um, but we really thrive on the support from um, people everywhere that believe in what we do. And so if you're interested in um, supporting our work, um, and, and I know the foundation um, has already made a commitment, um, please let me know. You can contact me um, or you can contact Lauren directly and Lauren directs all of our development opportunities. So with that, um, we're uh, a little bit over seven, but like I said, if people wanna stay on, I'm happy to hang out for a little while and uh, answer some questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. A um, Couple questions. Um, so Eileen had a question, when might the Shine On test be available to most dogs? And uh, will EBAT also become more available? That was one of the questions I had too when I was yeah. uh, listening. So let me answer the second part first and then I'll answer the first part second. Um, EBAT is actually licensed to a company called Anavive Life Sciences. It is going through the process of FDA approval. Um, things are going okay. So um, no major speed bumps so far. But if you know anything about the FDA um, is that generally speaking, they are not fast. They're, they're faster than they used to be, but they're not fast. So it is, it is a consistent dialogue. Um, I am optimistic that EVAT will make it out of FDA with a uh, conditional approval that will get it out into the marketplace um, um, probably within the next year or two years, I hope. Uh, don't hold me to that because I can't, I don't work for the FDA and I can't predict things that they might ask us to do. And what conditional approval means is that it can be marketed and the company will have a um, four year time period to actually document to the FDA that the, the, the outcomes in the real world are comparable to the outcomes in the experimental world. And at that point, if, if the drug performs as intended, uh, it is awarded a full approval and, uh, you know, then it can, um, the company can choose to add other indications or do other things with it. So um, EBAT is on the way and hopefully it'll be out there. And, and again, in the conditional time period, there might be some restrictions. Um, the, the shine on test, which is what we're working on, um, is, is a little bit harder slog. Um, it, um, what, what we wanna do is we wanna make a test that's accessible to everyone. So you, you might have, um, been informed or you might even have had some of the tests that are available out there now to do early detection in your dog and and the the cost is rather high right it is it is really targeted to that top one percent or five percent um we'd like to actually keep it at the point where the 80 percent of dog owners would be able to afford the test um so so we're working not only to to make sure that what we say is exactly what we mean, that we have full confidence that the test is performing as we believe it can, um, but also that there's accessibility to the solution, meaning if we're going to tell you that your dog is at risk of developing hemangiosarcoma, that you have access to the drug that could prevent hemangiosarcoma, and to also work with the company to make sure that economically or financially, that access is not out of reach of the average dog owner. Um, so, so that we're doing less harm than good, right? If we have the test out there, but you don't have the solution, again, we might be doing more harm than good. So, so there's um, sort of the, the, the trials and tribulations and perils of a small startup company um, trying to find the, the right path, the right partner, the right financing to get the test done into the real world. 
and working with our partners at a pharmaceutical company that now owns the drug to find a solution. While at the same time, academically, we're trying to develop more tests, better tests, less expensive tests, more drugs, better drugs, even safer drugs than EVAT, and more effective drugs to come up with a solution so that um, you know we're, we're always trying to stay one head, one step ahead of um, where the disease is going. So um, I don't have an answer for when Shine On as a test will be available. There's, there's too many variables, but we hope that um, um, before I retire, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you. What are the symptoms of um, hemangiosarcoma and what are the current uh, diagnostic tools and treatment? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So the symptoms of hemangiosarcoma range from um, none to sudden death. And, and so the symptoms are caused because these tumors um, form within the blood vessels. And so they, they actually start growing around the blood vessel and inside the blood vessel. And what happens is they, they occlude. So, th so think of a, a hose and think of a uh, you know, clot of mud that, that, that forms inside the hose and it just prevents the water or the blood from going through. So blood normally brings oxygen and nutrients, right? And so if you can see, this is, this is the hole, right? And, and there's a clot here, so the, the blood can't go further. So on the other side, things start getting starved for oxygen and nutrients, and those cells start dying. And when they die, because they are part of a blood vessel, they, they die on both sides of the clot, and that blood vessel ruptures and blood starts coming out. So if it's a little trickle, the body can actually seal it up, and death doesn't happen, but, but there's blood loss, right? And so the animal will be anemic, and will feel crummy. And so people will say, I noticed that my dog three weeks ago didn't want to eat or was feeling really pokey or didn't want to get up or looked really tired uh, or slept more than it normally would. But because these are mostly older dogs, people don't really notice, right? My, my 11 year old dog took a nap. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. But sometimes it happens. And then three days later, it happens again, or three weeks later, it happens again. Um, and so some owners are very, very observant. Others are just lucky. and the, the tumor is caught because there's those signs of, of um, sort of recurrent bleeding that lead to um, lethargy, you know, uh, tiredness, inappetence, lower activity. Uh, other times you have a tumor that ruptures acutely and, and it's a big tear. And, and, you know, we've all heard the story of the Labrador that jumps up to grab the ball and lands on the grass and is dead because the tumor ruptured and all its blood just gushed into its abdomen and it's gone. So, so one of the things that's really hard is that there are no, no overt signs because the tumors grow in areas where there's no innervation. They don't necessarily create problems with other organs. And so we, we don't have this progressive like renal failure or cardiac failure, right? It's, it's just like constitutional nonspecific signs, sometimes sudden death. So that's one of the problems. We don't find it until it's really late. Um, um, how do we normally diagnose it? Um, we use routine laboratory tests. So we look um, at the blood to find if there's anemia, uh, low platelet counts, evidence of recurrent bleeding. We can see all that from routine, complete blood counts, chemistries, coagulation um, profiles. And then we use imaging. We use a lot of imaging. So conventional radiographs, um, uh, ultrasounds, and in some cases, um, CTs and, and even PET CTs. And we, uh, we published a paper now some years ago showing that um, the sort of the conventional imaging um, tends to miss maybe a quarter of um, cases where there are um, tumors or tumors present in other locations. But um, those technologies like PET CT are really not readily accessible or, or really justifiable financially and radiation exposure and otherwise as routine things. And so they, they remain experimental. But I think as, as our methods improve and as we start building artificial intelligence into our imaging um, processes, we might actually become much better at using conventional imaging to diagnose this uh, a little earlier. Um, and of course, treatment is, is still a question mark. Conventional treatment, um, the standard of care is surgery to remove uh, any accessible tumor, and this is one of the few tumors where even if there are metastasis, surgery is still indicated. You want to remove those potential sources 
of a life-threatening hemorrhage, um, followed by chemotherapy. And everything else is either a legitimate experiment or an uncontrolled experiment where somebody's trying to sell you that and some swamp land in Florida. So when you read the internet and you hear about all of these miracle drugs and herbs and supplements and diets and how, you know, Fluffy lived 33 years by taking this stuff when it was diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma, um, go buy the swamp land in Florida. It'll be a better investment than buying the supplements. And, and I know that, that there might be people in this in this webinar that say, I used this stuff and it worked great. And uh, I say, that's wonderful. Um, you could have saved the money and it would have worked just as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question we had from Millicent Parker is, is there any correlation with Ehrlichia, I might be pronouncing that wrong, or other vector-borne diseases? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and the answer is, um, so, so the answer is that there's a little bit of conflicting information here. Um, the group at North Carolina State, led by Dr. Um, Breitschwert, has published that um, they see an association with Bart Bartonella, is another bug, um, and hemangiosarcoma. So um, they've published uh, one paper, a couple of, of abstracts, maybe a second paper recently or coming soon. Um, we tried, well, we didn't quite, repeat their um, testing, but we, we essentially looked for Bartonella in, in our cohort. So we have a cohort of about 120 dogs where we had samples and we looked for the presence of Bartonella in um, those samples. And using a very, very sensitive method, what we found is that um, in a handful of dogs, we had um, evidence of the presence of Bartonella using um, genome sequencing but the Bartonellas that we found were actually contaminants from the human handlers that prepped the samples because the Bartonellas that we found uh, do not infect dogs. They only infect humans. So, so in our data, um, and, and that paper is actually in a preprint server. We haven't finished writing the one that's gonna go out for peer review, but it is publicly available. Um, we found no evidence of Bartonella or any other microorganism that's in the catalog of life that we can actually test for um, that would be associated with hemangiosarcoma. So um, this, this is not me saying that the North Carolina group is wrong and we're right. This is me saying that they found something. Uh, we didn't find it where we looked. Um, if, if their samples are biased to North Carolina or the Southeast, there's going to be a higher prevalence of these infections across the dog population. And so that might be part of it. Um, our samples, you know, 100 and plus samples come from um, all over, but we definitely have biases to sort of the, the um, Midwest, Colorado, California, New England. And so we, we have many fewer samples that come from Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. And so that may be part of the explanation. Um, again, we, we have no evidence that, that any bug is related to the disease. Um, they have some evidence that that these two things occur simultaneously. So more work needs to be done. Does anybody else have any other questions? Let us call for questions. All right. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, for anybody that wants to uh, donate, the uh, site again is give.umn.edu to support the Mariano Lab and further this important research. Um, and I think our club will also be making a, a donation uh, in thanks for you giving us this presentation. Uh, I know I thank you from the entire club and, and for Eileen as well. Eileen, chime in, uh, feel free. Um, but heartfelt thanks for this important information. I, we really, really thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been a pleasure, like I said.